So, hi everyone. Um, hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm Luka Jakubowicz, um, and this is building a tagless final DSL for WebGL. Now, this sounds a bit crazy, I agree, but um, yeah, let's just get started. And I'm just going to say up front, this is going to be a lot of like technical um, functional programming stuff. So if at any point I kind of lose you or something, just uh, like put your hands up and tell me. I'm going to try to explain it bit by bit. OK, so let's start with the motivation for this talk. Oftentimes, as functional programmers, we want to interface with some super imperative libraries, right? So um, as functional programmers, we want to avoid basically all kinds of different side effects. Um, and this works pretty well if we're in our own environment and um, never have to leave, um, for example, the Scala world. But oftentimes, we have to interact with like a Java library or worse, a C library. And in, the, in this case, uh, a graphics library, which is like the, the most imperative it, it can get, right? So this is exactly why I um, chose this kind of library. And also because I'm kind of into graphics programming. So how can we then give these libraries a really nice and clean functional API? This is going to be the main question of this talk. So the first idea is how not to do it, right? Um, the first solution is just to wrap everything in an I.O. type. Um, how, how many of you are familiar with like an I.O. type like the Cat's Effect I.O. or Monix task? Okay, yeah, that's, that's quite a few. Okay, I'm, just for the others, um, basically you can think of I.O. as kind of like a lazy future. Um, it's not just for asynchronous effects, it's also for synchronous effects. Basically, it just takes all of the side effects uh, and captures them so they don't become side effecty anymore and you, you will run them at the edge of your program. So they basically defer all, all of your interactions with the outside world. And this is a small snippet. Um, basically what happens here is that we're uh, creating a canvas element, a canvas DOM element. This is Scala.js. And then uh, we, we're getting the WebGL context. And then we're uh, clearing the background color. And then we'll just print something to, to the console. Um, but this, this has several problems. And those are like, it breaks, it completely breaks the separation of concerns, right? So the first two kind of have something to do with the DOM and WebGL. And then we get this, um, get this call into the GL API. And then we also print something to the console, but these are totally orthogonal, and we don't need to actually have them all inside of the same I.O. monad. Oh, I said the M word too soon, sorry. Um, also, this is really, really hard to test, because the only thing you can do with an I.O. is run it in the end, and um, basically we're, we're back to zero, where we have to test that all of our side effects we just run occurred. And um, that, as most of you probably know, is pretty messy. And it's really hard to keep track of the level of abstraction because I.O. can wrap a super high level library, but it can also wrap a low level library. Right here we see um, something like DOM create element is pretty high level. It does a lot of things under the hood, but GL clear color is just, uh, it just sets a flag to, um, to clear the, to clear the, uh, the buffer uh, that, that is used for, for the color of the canvas. So we have all of these problems. And the, the biggest problem is that this is basically, in no way is it nicer or safer than just actually calling all of these, content, uh, calling all of these functions without I.O. It's purely functional, but it's not nice. Uh, so it would be really, really cool if you could use a functional DSL to access these imperative libraries. And um, as you probably guessed from the title, we're going to do just that. Um, and as a quick aside, uh, if you've read my, my, uh, my abstract for this talk, I talk about eDSLs. And I realize it's not very common. So what actually is the eDSL? So DSL stands for domain-specific languages, or domain-specific language. and um, 
Very common examples of these are GLSL, which is the OpenGL, WebGL uh, shading language, um, SQL shell scripts. So what these are are basically um, languages that are constrained to do some one thing and do them very well, and um, they're not they're not uh, meant to be uh, general purpose programming languages. And eDSLs, which are embedded DSLs, are actually embedded into another language. And usually this language, this host language, is a general purpose language. And this is really common in languages like Haskell and Scala. And basically what we do is we build up a tree of expression inside the language, and then we uh, compile that to the actual target language. Right, so for example, if we wanted to build um, a language that represents uh, very simple arithmetic, we could build an AST for that and just um, convert it to the actual um, expressions that the, the, the language under the hood would use. Okay, so what kind of EDSLs are there? I kind of took that away, but of course there are abstract syntax trees um, and usually in, sorry? Someone say something? Okay. Um, abstract syntax trees, and usually we model these as um, algebraic data types or generalized algebraic data types. And yeah, that's the example I just said. We could use these to model more complex things, but um, we kind of run into uh, limitations quickly because it's not really that expressive if we want to, um, for example, run effects in a specific way and um, if you try to build an AST API for WebGL, I think you'll have a really bad time. So an alternative to that is the free monad or the free applicative. Um, how many of you have ever heard of that? Oh, quite a, quite a couple, that's good. So basically, um, what monads are, and Jakub had a cool talk about that, um, monads basically allow us to, to, um, to express dependent computations, right? So if we have um, a chain of futures, for example, we want to run run and then get the result and do something with, with, with this result and then uh, get another future from that. So this is what monads are really good for. And if we look at um, most of these imperative languages, it's pretty easy to, uh, to model these as monadic comprehensions, which in Scala are, of course, for comprehensions. And the free applicative comes in when we want independent uh, effects, independent commutations. So that means, um, for example, running things in parallel. So these are um, really cool if you want to do this kind of stuff. But they also come with a lot of both cognitive and uh, runtime overhead, because we now have to think about all of these different algebras, and we have to lift them into this free monad thing, and uh, then we have to compile it with a natural transformation, and it's just a lot of buzzwords that um, it's kind of difficult to keep up, especially if you're a beginner. And so there's an alternative, and that one is called tagless final. And um, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So tagless final, what is it? Um, basically, it's a way to, uh, uh, to build a DSL, and to do so, we model our algebras, and our algebra are just our domain-specific um, values as traits, and then we parameterize them with a type constructor. Um, and a type constructor, of course, is just um, something that needs an actual type to, to become a, a, an actual type. So, for example, list is a type constructor, whereas list of int is a type, right? So, or option is a type constructor, option of int is a type. Right, so this is how we model our algebras, and then uh, we, to um, actually get a program out of this, we constrain the type parameter however we want. Um, if we want dependent effects, we can use a monad, or if we want independent effects, we could use an applicative, there are different things we can do. These are just two ideas that are um, very popular because, um, well, most of our computations are either dependent or independent. Yes, John. Uh, could, you, could you describe the difference between dependent and independent effects, please? Yes, of course. Um, 
So uh, when we talk about monads, we talk about dependent, um, dependent computations. And this is if you have, for example, uh, an either, right? And um, you, want to, you want to see if, uh, you want to basically observe the, the inner value, but you don't, you don't know if it's actually there. It might be there or there might be an error type, right? So uh, if you then use the flat map method, you get the, you get the actual value as, uh, in, inside the function, and then you can use it to create another value of either. And basically, uh, this requires the first either to actually be there, right? And um, if you use something like the cats validated, the, um, this does, it does not actually uh, have, for example, a monad instance. It's an applicative in the sense that you can use independent, uh, you can combine them independent of each other, which means that you, get, uh, you don't get this, um, you don't get this fail fast, um, this fail fast behavior, but you get, uh, error accumulation across several things. And it's, it's the same thing, for example, if you run a future, get something from like a server, and dependent on that thing, you will create another future that gets another thing. Or if you don't actually care about the first value and just want to run two futures, you can run them in parallel. So they're independent of each other and therefore can be parallelized. So sometimes people also talk about this in terms of monads or like the sequential operation or they support sequential um, operations and applicatives support independent and parallel uh, computations. I hope that's clear. Okay, great. So, like I said, we can constraint our type parameter however we want. We could use monad, applicative, or the more, uh, the less constrained flat map and apply type classes, but uh, this is basically the essence of the, the, the pattern. And then, uh, because our algebras are just traits, our interpreters for these algebras are simply impl implementations, right? And I'll show you a quick ex example. So, this is the basic example. Um, it's, it's pretty overused, but this, this can describe basically all console programs. So, our algebra here is, t is called console, and it has two actions. The first one is print line, which, well, just prints a line, on the console, and the other one is read line, which will return a string read from the console. And we can see here our type constructor f um, basically represents the context in which this is in. So when we now use the, um, we now create a program for this console, <laughs> and we can then constrain this f with the monad, and this means we get, uh, this means that Every interpreter for this, for this program will have to provide uh, a monad instance, and that is in essence the flat map and map methods, which are required to use this for comprehension, right? So uh, in, the, in this program, we, we simply take a console right here of type f, and then um, we print line, please enter your name, then we read the line that comes back, and after that we just print you're entered, and you're, then your name. This is a super, super basic program, but it kind of shows how, uh, how these DSLs might work. And now, an interpreter for this, and I've used Monik's task here, is just um, can model it as an object or a val, but basically it's just um, a new instance of this console trait right here. So we have to implement both methods, print line and read line, and because we, we chose the task type constructor, the, the print line method will now return task unit, and the read line will now return task string. And then we can just um, run our program by inserting the interpreter, and now this part right here is a task. And because our program returns well, it doesn't say here, but our program returns uh, f of unit. This thing will now be a task of unit, and to run it, we can use this run async uh, function. So this is the very, very basic example. Um, does everyone kind of, does this kind of make sense so far? Questions? No? Okay, great. So, and um, a very difficult thing you have when you're using free monads or similar things is um, 
combining different kinds of algebras, right? So I said at the beginning that we want to, um, we want to leverage separation of concerns. That means that, for example, we don't want an algebra that includes both our DOM, our console, our WebGL. So we want to actually uh, separate these things. And so we, have, we, we use another algebra. For example, here I've chosen the key value store. And it's defined by a put method, which takes a, street, uh, a key as a string and uh, an A, which is generic and then just returns unit, which means it, does, it will just store the, the, key, uh, the key and the value, right? And then to get it out, we just give them a key, and then because it might not be there, we get an option of A. And now right here, we, um, we create another program, and the only change we had to make to, uh, to use this KV store is just add another parameter right here. So combining algebras with uh, tagless final is super simple. And if, you've if you tried to do the same with free monads, you would have to think about um, building up a huge co-product. And um, usually what, what, what people do is use something like inject k. Yes, question? Um, why did you change the type of f of underscore black man? It was a monad, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, this is actually a really interesting point I wanted to mention later. But um, yeah, very good question. So basically, uh, monad is a subtype of flat map. And flat map is the, basically the same as monad, but it doesn't define the, the pure function. And pure is basically uh, lifting a value of a into an f of a. And, but we don't actually use it anywhere here, right? We don't actually need it. So what tagless final allows us to do is use the um, the principle of least power to, to uh, constrain our programs with exactly what we need them to be. So we could, for example, this allows us to use more interpreters that might not have a monad instance, but have a flat map instance. So unlike the free monad and the free applicative, we don't ha actually have to constrain the type um, as an applicative or a monad. We can use whatever our program actually needs. And I think this is super powerful. So another thing that is really cool that we can do, and uh, I actually got this from, from uh, Rob Norris, who, um, who implements Doobie, uh, which is a database library. And what you can do is you can layer your DSLs. And what this means, basically, is you can use a very low-level DSL. Uh, for example, if we use GL, we might define a really low-level DSL that is, very, that is almost exactly the um, the actual library calls. And then we can define a higher level DSL that will actually compile into the other language, right? So we can build up stacks of languages. So we can have a very low level language and then uh, interpret that into something like Monix task, for example. Then we have a mid, mid level language that we interpret into the lower level language. And then a high level language that interprets into the mid level language. So you can basically choose the level of of abstraction that is appropriate, right? For some, some kind of uh, programs, we might need very high abstraction because it's enough. Uh, but for some other, we might need to go into uh, more of the lower level. So this right here is, a, um, is an algebra called prompt. And it takes a message. And it will then return um, an f of string. And Basically, what this should do, based on the types, is uh, print out something and then get something back. So now we can define our um, prompt console interpreter, and it will, uh, it will compile or interpret our prompt algebra into uh, the console algebra. So if we have an interpreter for console, we can combine this with the prompt console interpreter to get an interpreter for prompt. And this is really cool. Um, yeah, and in essence, this is just um, just printing the message right here and then reading the line and then yielding it uh, to get the f of string back. And again, we use a flat map here to get the for comprehension. OK. Make sense so far? Good. OK, so let's check out some code I wrote in actual WebGL. So. Um, and what I tried to do is to basically um, 
build an SNES style game uh, with the likes of Mario Kart, SNES, or um, uh, F Zero. So basically, what they did is they um, the SNES had a special chip that allowed uh, certain textures to be rendered um, with with what is called a perspective projection, and we'll see about that in a minute. But basically, it allows allows us this 3D effect with uh, 2D textures, and it's pretty cool. So what we just want to do is we have this super cool racetrack right here, and then we'll want to uh, run a car that looks like this across this racetrack. So it's pretty simple, but it's also, if you have to think about it in terms of like graphics programming, it's a lot of work we actually have to do. So first up, I, I started with um, the WebGL algebra, and this is just the super low level. This is basically exactly what the um, GL library actually uh, supports. So we, right here we have things like clear color, clear, um, create shader, shader source, compile shader. So we, we realize we have to do a lot of steps to actually get like a simple texture uh, onto the screen. So to get a texture onto the screen, you have to create a shader. You have to compile that shader. Um, and then we have vertex and fragment shaders, so we have to create and compile two shaders. Then we have to link them together to a program. And once we have that program, we have to use it. We have to create a texture. We have to bind that texture to, uh, to actual pixels. And all of these things. And this is the low-level API, so, so we're going to get there. Um, next, there's also a DOM, DOM API that um, basically just supports the operations uh, I needed. So if you wanted to build like an actual DOM API, it would be a lot larger and probably you would have to split it up into several algebras. But right here I have uh, an algebra that allows us to append a canvas to a body. We can create an image element. We can render something in a loop. Uh, and we also get um, keyboard events. or uh, We can define listeners for keyboard events. So these are the low-level APIs. Now let's have a look at something a bit higher level, and this is called draw image, and um, it's kind of my medium-level API. So the algebra I defined right here allows us to very simply draw something on the screen uh, as a texture. So right here we can see the function uh, compile vertex shader, and instead of just um, having to do all of these steps we saw earlier, which is create a shader, compile it, see if it has any errors. We just get back uh, either, an, either a string or a vertex shader. So the string represents an error. If we were to do it in a higher level, we would probably use some kind of ADT for errors. But um, yeah, and then we can do the same for fragment shaders. And if we have both a vertex shader and a fragment shader, we can then create a program with it right here. And that will, that, could still, um, in essence, even if we have a valid vertex shader and a valid, valid fragment shader, this might still uh, cause an error. So we still get um, either a string, either an error, or a WebGL program. And then we can also create a texture info. If we have an HTML image element, we get a WebGL texture. And once we have all of these, once we have a program, a texture, and a matrix for, which is um, well, basically, where we want to render this texture and how with, with, with which, which parameters. Um, if you've done graphics programming in the past, you probably had to use a lot of matrix math, but that's what it is. Um, so this allows us to draw an image. So let's check out a, um, an interpreter for that that compiles into the low-level uh, WebGL language. So basically, what this does is um, it, it well, it, uh, it defines the, the, the methods on the draw image algebra we saw before, and it compiles them to calls on the WebGL algebra. So here we have something like clear screen. It's just going to call clear color, and then it's going to clear it. If we want to compile a shader, we'll use uh, for comprehension, which builds up basically um, well, uh, either the string or the shader. And this is just the implementation. And see, it's a lot of low-level code. But we already, if we use the 
Draw Image API, it's already a lot nicer than dealing with all of these kind of things. And we could um, then create a program from something like this. I think I have one here somewhere. Program 2.5D. So what I did right here is define a, a vertex shader in line, a fragment shader in line. Uh, I created a, a mat matrix that represents the track scale, the track translation, which translation is just the position, basically a, a scaling for the car and a rotation, also a view matrix. Then um, I combine all of these effects to get a full, uh, full size canvas. Uh, I append that canvas to the body. I create a projection matrix. Then I compile the fragment shader, the vertex shader. Um, I try to compile these together to a program. Uh, I create image elements for our two, two uh, elements for our racetrack and our car. Then I try to create textures out of those. I clear the screen and then I basically just draw the, those two images. So this would give us a perfect example of a static image, but we actually want to get something like a game. So I created an even higher level algebra. And it's, it's, only, it's only two methods long, so it's a lot shorter. Um, and I called it render engine. I'm not sure if that's the best name, but uh, naming is hard, I guess. <laughs> And um, first, we have this initialize method. And it just takes some options, which are totally, um, totally abstract. Because uh, for, for the higher level algebra, I tried to just abstract everything that doesn't have anything to do with the actual, um, uh, that, that doesn't have anything to do with the actual logic. I just put it as a type parameter right here. So all we get right now is, basically the, the logic that we want. So um, the error type that we get back if the initialization fails isn't really relevant. It's part of the interpretation. Uh, the context we might get back that to, use, uh, to, to use after initialization isn't really part of the logic. It's part of the implementation. And same as the texture type. So I abstracted all of these away. And um, what we get is an initialize method that takes some kind of options and either returns an error or a context subject. Then we can use this context to render something in a loop. And to do that, we give it a, a seed, uh, which is render output, which just has the camera and a list of objects. And then we also have uh, a function that takes a set of keys and uh, an old uh, the, the last uh, frame's camera positions and returns a new camera. So in this set of keys are all the um, keys that are pressed uh, during one frame. And then we can use those to create uh, the next frame um, by giving the new camera um, the new coordinates. So um, if we actually look at this, Let's actually run it. I've compiled it before. I'm not going to compile it right now, but this is the result of this. I basically just uh, used this algebra to build a very simple game. It has two elements. All it does is uh, we can rotate our car and we can drive forward. And I think this is pretty cool. <laughs> can just Take a, take a small round here. Um, but yeah, I think what this really allows us to do, this technique, is to build up computations and, um, and uh, then interpret them in all different kinds of ways. So right now, I built an, a WebGL program for this, but I could also build all kinds of different programs. Um, for example, testing this is a lot easier because there is no actual um, implementation inside our program anywhere. It's all in the interpreter. Um, yeah, so let's get back to my slides. So as a bonus, we can also achieve parallelism. And um, if any of you have tried to use the free monad before, um, you, you notice that because of the monad's sequential nature, it is super difficult to do anything in parallel. And 
With, uh, with tagless final, we can just use this parallel type class uh, as an implicit, and then we, can, we get access to these par map end functions, or also par traverse, and which are basically um, functions that are in the cats uh, library, but uh, optimized for parallelism. So uh, if you're thinking like, you, do you need to do parallel or not? Um, and if you're trying to decide to use the free monad or a tagless final, uh, then the tagless final definitely wins out here. Okay, so I've got some other cool things. Um, while difficult, it's totally possible to inspect and optimize our programs. And um, this is something uh, I've, I've learned from a paper by Oleg Kizelyov, who writes a lot of these super abstract uh, Haskell papers that are really, really cool. Um, but basically, um, one of the coolest things you can do with a free applicative is um, to inspect all of the actions inside a, a layer of the free applicative and uh, apply optimizations to that. So for example, with the free applicative, uh, if you have a bunch of calls to a backend, um, you could look inside all of these calls and just uh, optimize them to, to do one call to the backend instead. Um, and it's kind of difficult to do this, so if you actually want to do this with tagless final, I recommend you uh, look at Oleg's paper. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's totally possible. And um, if you have like a lot of algebras and interpreters, um, it sometimes can get a bit messy to compose them and transform them. So um, a friend of mine, Kai Luo Wang, he wrote this super cool Maine Coon library and um, it allows us to do, uh, to do a lot of these, uh, these compo compositions we don't usually get when we just combine different traits. Um, and it's, uh, it makes a lot of things a bit easier. So if you want to uh, use tagless final, I recommend checking that out. And also, um, because tagless final um, interpretation is not uh, essentially stack safe, we, we could make it stack safe by uh, compiling a tagless final um, algebra, into, uh, tagless final program uh, into, into the free monad and then interpret it from there. So uh, free monad, uh, Free monads give us stack safety, uh, whereas tagless final does not. But we can amend that by compiling into the free monad, and uh, that is actually a super simple thing to do, and then uh, interpret from there. So we could technically get stack safety back. But um, stack safety in tagless final totally depends on the monad or the data type you compile into. So if you compile into a data type that is stack safe, you don't, act, you don't need to think about that at all. And uh, most of the time, like if you use tagless final, you're probably going to compile into like something like Monix task or cats IO or Scala Z task, Scala Z, the new Scala Z IO. So this is not really a huge issue, but it's possible. And this brings me to the conclusions. Tagless final allows us to use our own algebras for defining interactions, right? We can define these algebras um, in any way that our um, that our domain uh, that our domain sorry that our domain uh, actually needs. So, if we have an algebra for creating WebGL programs, we can create that. Um, but usually, if we have like a complex business problem, we can um, constrain it to different domains and we can define an algebra for each of that. And then we can use these algebras uh, and compose them and layer them to create actual programs. And we can define multiple interpreters for each of our algebras and this gives us great flexibility and the ability to test and refactor, right? So if we want to change something um, but we're not sure uh, where to actually change it, in tagless final, we, if we want to change something in the logic, we look at our programs. If we want to change uh, something in the implementations, we look into the interpreter. So these things are really super separated and it gives us a lot of, um, a lot of flexibility and it makes refactoring a lot easier. And the cool thing I talked about earlier is that we can use the principle of least power. So if we don't need monads, don't use them, 
If we don't need applicatives, don't use them. If we, if we need these uh, fancy things, we can use them. If we need uh, error handling inside our, um, inside our type constructor, we could use something like monad error or similar things, but it's exactly as powerful as we need it to be. And the last thing is we can work at an extra level of abstraction, but maintain flexibility, right? So we can define this high level algebra for WebGL, but we can also maintain flexibility by always jumping into the lower level algebra and working from there. And yeah, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Luca Jacobowitz, or you can play the game on github.com slash LucaJCB tagless webgl. Uh, there's no scoring mechanism, but you can drive around. It's fun. Check it out. Thanks. OK, I think we have time for questions, right? Yeah. What was the last thing? Sorry. Um, like, do we need what different types of information in the database? So it's more sense. So, like, unit testing is great. Yeah. But I think there's like this active cost to introduce it to my team and probably learn. Sure, sure. And I think we, we, we don't do this, it's kind of, it's this, there's no cost to be back with this if we decide we need to have testing later. And just, yeah, the question is just how do I sell this to my team? Sure. Um, and I think. Most of the time, you don't need something like this. But if you have to interact with something like WebGL, like something like JDBC, something that is super imperative and are something our functional programming minds can't really work with, like doing all of these imperative calls, then it, make, it, it makes sense uh, to use it. Because if we, if we already have good abstractions for things like databases or uh, other things, we don't need it. But if you want to write this WebGL stuff in Scala, I promise you it's going to be messy and it's going to be impossible to test. Uh, and well, probably what it would end up look, looking like is some kind of uh, code that no one ever actually tested. You always have to run it manually. And this gives you a lot of, like, well, as I said, power to actually um, be, be, be more, uh, well, have the ability to reason more about what you're actually doing. So. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this for doing all the things just for like imperative uh, things you want to act, interact with. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.